Hi, and welcome to a quick tutorial on how to do a dye hybrid cross in genetics. Dye hybrid crosses are a little more challenging than mono hybrid crosses because we are looking at two traits at the same time and keeping track of both of those traits as we go through the cell division and fertilization process. So let's start out by assigning allele names to the traits that we're going to look at. In previous videos, we talked about individuals that were albino, big A for having melanin, meaning that they are capable of making melanin in skin, and that's a dominant trait, and little a for albino, which is a recessive trait, meaning that you can make zero melanin at all. And even though I don't make much melanin, I can still make melanin. So that's one trait. And dihybrid crosses, we're trying to look at how two traits are inherited at the same time. So uh, let's look at ear shape. Now, ear shape can be either attached or dangly earlobes. So it turns out that dangly earlobes is dominant and attached earlobes is recessive. If you don't know what I'm talking about, if this was a face, I'm not the best artist, but if this is a face, an earlobe that dangles, would you'd have a little earlobe down there versus if it's attached, the ear kind of goes straight into the head like that. Okay, so let's take a look at what it would be if we had two individuals that are both heterozygous for both skin color and earlobe shape. That looks like this. Heterozygous for both the ability to make melanin and earlobe shape. And we're having both individuals be that. So both individuals would have the same genotype. When we're doing the next step, which is, as if you've learned anything from my previous videos, we make a table of gametes and we're trying to figure out the, what would happen during meiosis. So this is what the table of gametes looks like. I'm gonna make the gametes for one parent over here and the other parent over here. So um, when we have a dihybrid cross, there's a little trick that is nice to use to figure out the, the gametes. And I call it the FOIL method. FOIL in math stands for first, outer, inner, and last. In math class, you would do it across the multiplication sign, but this is not really the way it works in biology because in biology, um, we're not making gametes with another person. We make our own gametes. So we would do FOIL here with these within this one individual we take the first letter of the first gene and pair it up with the first letter of the second gene and when you do that you would make the gamete big a big e this in this gamete is haploid here meaning it only has half of the amount of information there's four alleles in this genotype there's only two alleles that go into the gamete and again this is a gamete which is kind of fun to draw a little spermy tail. So the next one is outer. And so we're gonna take the outer ones here and here and put those into a gamete, which would be big A, little e. Then we do the inner. So inner would look like this. And you would draw this gamete, very interestingly, little a, big e. The reason that we keep it little a first, even though it looks really awkward, is because we don't want to um, go out of order. Like if we start all of a sudden putting E's first, that can be a little confusing. And then of course our lasts. So this is the last allele of the first gene and this is the last allele of the second gene. And so that gamete would look like this. The same thing would happen over here. It's the same genotype, so we're going to just write them again. But of course, egg meets sperm, so we need some we need some eggs here. So let's just write these four gametes out, just like we wrote on the other side. I'm just doing a mental foil here. 
The next thing that we do is we put them into a Punnett square. So let's draw our Punnett square. This Punnett square is going to be a four by four Punnett square. So it's gonna be kind of big. Leave yourself plenty of room as you draw out your four by four Punnett square. And then you put all of these gametes on the outside. One mistake that's very common for people to do and that you really, really should not do is to separate these from each other again. We've gone through meiosis. We have made sperm. Sperm don't break up into smaller bits. So we, like one mistake people do is they put, they go like this. We, we wanna avoid that mistake. So the right thing to do is just to copy these gametes over like this. And then of course the same going across the top of our Punnett square. And the same thing is going to happen that's happened before within Punnett squares. We're predicting what the outcome of the offspring would be if one particular sperm fertilizes one particular egg. It's really important when you fill these, um, these predictions in that you put the A's back together and the E's back together. So it would look like this because it's going to be much easier to interpret the phenotypes when you put the letters back together for each gene. So we're just gonna fill this out. If you wanna pause and do this on your own, now's a good time to do that. I'm just gonna go ahead and fill out all of these letters as I speak to you. That way you can see my thought process. So bringing the A's together and the E's together. A's together and E's together. Same thing. It's a little bit tedious, but it's really important that you're very careful. Um, making a mistake here can change your overall ratio that we're gonna report at the end. Notice when I'm putting these letters back together, the big letters within a gene go together, big letter before little, and then at the second gene, big letter before little, but we're gonna keep our A's before the E's. This one always looks a little awkward, but this is exactly how you need to write it. Oops, little e. See, I said, be careful of mistakes. That I almost made a mistake there. Okay, so this is our prediction, but we need to put it in the form of a ratio. And let's just do the phenotypic ratio. The phenotypic ratio is looking at the specific combination of phenotypes in each box. So inside this box, we have an individual that has melanin and dangly ears. So the technique I like to use is just to write down the phenotypes of the individuals in the first box. And then I'm just gonna count up how many of those I see. And I'm gonna cross them off as I go. So this one is one individual that has melanin and dangly ears. And we're just gonna look at each individual going along the way. This individual has melanin and dangly ears. Two, melanin and dangly ears. Three, melanin and dangly ears. Four, five, ooh, not that one. That one has attached ear lobes. We're gonna skip over that one. Six, not that one. Seven, eight, nine. Remember that mistake I almost made? That's little e, little e right there. So there were nine of them, nine melanin and dangly earlobes. And then we put a colon and then I just go up and I find the next box that's not crossed off and I write down the phenotype <coughs> of that individual. This individual has melanin, but attached earlobes. Uh, and I've run out of space, so I'm just gonna write it below here. So it's gonna be melanin and attached. And how many of those do we see? To make sure I'm keeping things straight, I'm gonna cross it off in a different way. I'm gonna go in this angle. 
So this one is melanin attached, that's one, two, and again, skipping over the ones I've already crossed off. Not that one and that one. Here's the third one. So there's three. Three that have melanin unattached earlobes. Putting my colon there, I look at my next box that is not crossed off, and I have, um, I have individuals that are albino with dangly ears. So I just write that down, albino and dangly. And how many of those do I see? Um, so let's do a check mark. One, two, three. I have three of those. I only have one box left, and that individual is albino with attached earlobes. And there's only one of those. So this is the proper way to do a um, a predicted phenotype given that you have a dihybrid cross where each individual parent in the cross is, is heterozygous. There's a really common mistake that people make when they're doing the phenotype. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this over here and cover up the right answer and I'm gonna show you the wrong answer. This is what people do when they're not really understanding that you have to report both traits for each individual in the, in the phenotypic ratio. So what people do is they just count up how many uh, melanin there are. So if I just look at melanin, there would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. You write 12 melanin to, that would be four albino. And then they'd write a separate, um, a separate ratio for the earlobes, and there'd also be 12 dangly and four attached. But this is not allowed. Do not make this mistake of putting it this way. This is the right way to write a phenotypic ratio with showing both traits for each individual when you have a dihybrid cross.